All right. So um, welcome to Chibaco Chats. This is uh, the seventh edition of Chibaco Chats for this spring season. And we are interviewing authors as sort of a sneak peek to the Chibaco 2022 edition, which actually just arrived today. So anyone who's a member of the Mount Desert Island Historical Society should be receiving that in your mailboxes in the next couple of weeks. The theme for this year's Chibaco is Imagining What If, where we look at people or places or plans that were um, somehow uh, in process on Mount Desert Island and then for whatever reason ended up failing or are no longer present or maybe in some cases never even happened in the first place. And we challenged the authors to imagine what if this thing was still on the island? What would life be like and, and what could we imagine and what do we know about it for, um, you know, sort of based on what we can find in the historic record. So I'm really excited today to welcome back Roberto Rodriguez with the Seal Cove Auto Museum. He and I were colleagues together over there for a number of years and I had a really great time uh, exploring auto history and, and the role of the automobile, especially on Mount Desert Island. And Roberto has a great article in the upcoming Chivaco about a car manufacturing plant that was located in Bar Harbor, which was somewhat of a surprise. So while we get started, I'm gonna just screen share um, the PowerPoint presentation with everyone here. So um, we can take a look at that and have our conversation with Roberto. And um, welcome. So Roberto, um, we had a chance to work together at the Seal Cove Auto Museum. And um, specifically, we were working on an exhibit called Auto Wars, Then and Now, where we were looking at the past of whether or not to allow automobiles on Mount Desert Island. And that was a big debate taking place. And while we were doing the research for that in the online newspapers that are available through the Friends of Island History, we found a reference to the Boston Automobile Company and realized that there was a car manu manufacturing plant in downtown Bar Harbor in the early 1900s, which is really remarkable. Um, will you talk a little bit about sort of what you thought when you read about the fact that there was this automobile manufacturing plant in Bar Harbor and, and what you learned about it? Well, yeah, I, I was kind of floored. Uh, I would have thought that I'd heard about it or would have known about it. You discovered it in your research and brought it to my attention. And I, I must say, I was kind of dumbfounded. And I guess the first thought that came into my mind is, gosh, is one of them still around anywhere? Um, <laughs> and what sort of background or history can I find about it? Um, I didn't realize it would become kind of a, a major uh, research project for me at the time. I was uh, really kind of up to my ears with uh, the exhibit we were working on back then. And, you know, attentions were going to wonderful stories like the one about the three boys building their car in Bar Harbor and demonstrating it on the main street and also trying to track down photographs of cars. Uh, so I didn't really have at that moment, a lot of time to sort of divert and begin to get into research on this, this mysterious car built in Bar Harbor of all places. But <laughs> eventually um, I did get on the internet. Uh, I'm absolutely always dumbfounded of what you can find on the internet uh, and started a little search and you know, a few of those key words like Bar Harbor and automobile manufacturer in 1900 and so on. And by gosh, of course, uh, some information immediately popped up. And um, what, it, what it was saying was that the, the company was founded in 1900 in Bar Harbor, Maine. E. Shirley Goddard was the president. Paul Hunt was the manager. Um, and George P. Billings was the superintendent of the company. And the production of automobiles began. The brand name was initially Standard in 1900 and later Boston. And then from 1901, the vehicles were marketed as Bar Harbor. And in February of 1901, the vehicles were on display at the Boston Automobile Show. Who would have thought you could find information like that, but there it was. And now I had another epiphany and that was, oh, we do happen to have in the library a book that we actually had 
helped co-publish at the museum along with our friends at the Outset Transportation Museum. And that was a book uh, about the history of main built automobiles. And lo and behold, uh, the book is very thick. It's hard to get through, but I think anybody and everybody who ever had any role to play in building automobiles in Maine is listed in the book, along with license plate information. It's quite a book. Sure enough, there is a wonderful article uh, about the car in uh, Richard and Nancy Fraser's book, uh, The History of Maine Built Automobiles. And uh, the wonderful thing about that article is it includes their references. So I was able to see the Bar Harbor record from 1900 and a horseless magazine from May of 1900, and, you know, all the places they'd found information. And that then opened up the possibilities for research. So um, this was actually located in Bar Harbor, but why was yeah. it called the Boston Automobile Company? Oh, well, gee whiz. Um, Bar Harbor, of course, in those days was not referred to really as Bar Harbor, it was Eden, right? Uh, in fact, the, the horseless magazine doesn't refer to Bar Harbor at all. It says, you know, a company was established in Eden. So um, who knows? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> the name Eden was just a little bit too, I don't know, biblical for a car. I don't know. But they didn't choose the Eden. What they chose was the Boston. And, you know, really considering that uh, there were so many of the rusticators coming to the island, the wealthy people who could afford a car because cars were really expensive in those days. Um, they thought that probably Boston had a certain cachet to it, you know, a little bit ritzy, and that that would appeal to the kind of buyers they wanted to attract to buy their, their new automobile. So they, they settled on the Boston. So we've got um, a couple of images, and this is really interesting because these are not great images, but there's a reason for that. And um, so can you talk a little bit about, you know, this is, again, goes back to your research and, and of all the different histories that I've worked with and historians, I have to say car and auto historians are among the most thorough and prolific sharers of history to public record of anyone that I've ever seen. And I think that this story about these images sort of lends, um, you know, this sort of a, a perspective of how the, the historians in auto history really value sharing information. Yeah, we're kind of a passionate group, you know. Uh, we get kind <laughs> of wound up with this stuff. Um, the, the real source for nearly everything that we found were the fact now that you can search a number of the newspapers from this period online, which is wonderful. Uh, the Bar Harbor record being the main one from 1900. And <coughs> excuse me, you enter the keywords and uh, the, uh, the search engine starts finding these articles. And this particular ad that you see uh, appeared constantly, every, every, basically every month for a period of time, this little ad would appear in the Bar Harbor record. Um, but it is the only image that I was able to find of any sort of the car is from this rather faded, taken off the computer ad uh, of the car. And so to the left, you basically see what happens when you try to, to you know, pull one of these images off of a newspaper from that period, especially when it's on the internet and not high resolution. But it does at least give us a sense of the car. It's a really rather sweet uh, two seat uh, little buggy and you can see it has wire wheels to it. And I, I just love the Surrey with the fringe <laughs> on the top, yeah. <laughs> so um, the newspaper really had a lot of details about the Boston Automobile Company, especially related to the factory itself. So yeah. can you describe a little bit about what the factory on West Street included, what kind of activities were taking place there, and um, what the work was that they were doing for these automobiles. Yeah, um, it was a two-story building. It was 35 feet by uh, 60 feet. At least there were two buildings. The first one was this two-story 35 by 60 foot building, and it was uh, on West Street. Um, and it was filled really on the first floor with uh, 
with various machines. So this was the machine shop area. So there were lathes and drilling machines and tools needed to do iron work for the car. And in the back of that particular building was a blacksmith shop. So they really could handle all of the metal work associated with building one of these automobiles, which would have been frames and running gear and you know, uh, axles and so on and so forth. The second building next door was actually uh, a woodworking shop. And there had been a tradition, uh, you know, in Bar Harbor and uh, in, in making uh, carriages and coaches and so on, and carriages, I should say, not really coaches, uh, and cutters and buggies and so on. And this woodworking shop was set up to do that kind of work. The bodies on these cars were certainly not made out of metal. It really is nothing more than a one, one or two seat buggy from the period with a steam engine stuck in it. Right? Um, so that woodworking shop is where basically they could do the, the body work. And then on the second floor of the first building that I mentioned, they had the finishing area, uh, which was painting and upholstery. I, I would love to know how they managed to get the buggies up to the second floor. I imagine they had rope winches and so on. It must have been really quite something. Um, Mind you, there were old rope operated elevators back in those days, no problem at all. Uh, so, you know, they would have probably lifted the body in the state of assembly up to the second floor and done the painting and the upholstery work and then back downstairs for final assembly with engines and so on. So it was quite an operation. I mean, this is two fairly large buildings around West Street in Bar Harbor uh, producing automobiles in 1900. Neat. I found the description to be really uh, quite fascinating. And the other piece that was in the newspapers also described the workforce. And so sort of why the company decided to be in Bar Harbor was that it had a deep water port that, you know, they could be shipping these cars all over the place, that it was a year round workforce that was available. Real estate was less expensive. So they really was, it was pretty well thought out why they wanted to be here in Bar Harbor um, and that they, the company felt like it was going to be a very successful enterprise. And they did cite in the articles that they were shipping cars all over the place. Where, where were they shipping these cars and, um, and, and why? Well, according to the articles, uh, they had shipped uh, two cars to England, a gentleman in Lancaster, England. They had sent one to Bombay, India, and there was an order in progress for one to go to South Africa. It's pretty, pretty neat. Um, I think, you know, we're all kind of amazed that there was that much export and so on of automobiles so early in the game, but uh, related to other cars that I've researched, I found that absolutely um, American manufacturers at the time were, were shipping cars all over the world, England and India, for whatever reason, I think it was the wealth in India at the time was uh, were two countries that seemed to have a passion for ordering uh, American cars at the period. But sadly enough, very few of them still exist in collections over there. Uh, I've tried to find some of these wonderful old cars in private collections or museums in Bombay or parts of India and no luck at all. <laughs> well, um... It, it, it's interesting to see sort of where and um, that there was interest in these cars going outside of Bar Harbor. But the other reason that the manufacturing plant is mentioned for being in Bar Harbor is the clientele who come to Mount Desert Island. There was an assumption that that group of people would want to purchase a car here on the island. Um, can you talk a little bit about the culture of the island at the time and, and sort of the thinking behind the Boston Automobile Company and why they thought this was a good location from the standard of the or the standpoint of the clients? Well, yes. I mean, really, Eden in those days was uh, attracting incredibly wealthy families. Um, they would come to the island. They had this wonderful name that they referred to themselves as, as rusticators. I've always thought that was a really cute name, um, being rustic living in your multi, you know, your multi-bedroom mansion and having your servants, but it was a rustic way of life. And it was to come to this island to get away from the noise and smoke and pollution and hustle and bustle of the big city. And they would come to this wonderful Eden. And um, 
cars and automobiles at the time were the rage. If you had money, um, you owned an automobile. Uh, you had uh, specialty markets. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that at the time uh, there were uh, three major sources of power, steam, which if you think about it, is quite logical for the time period. I mean, everybody knew about steam locomotives. They traveled in them. They probably had been on board a steam powered ship. They knew that there were these huge steam engines powering factories at the time. So, you know, it was quite normal to think in terms of using a steam engine to power this newfangled automobile idea. The other, which I love, is the fact that electric cars were huge. I mean, electricity was new. People were just starting to experience electricity. It was this miracle that they'd never seen before, you know, to be able to light up a room and change day into or night into day. And electric motors were fitted to these buggies and they produced electric cars. And they were wildly popular with two segments. One were very wealthy women and the other were doctors. And the reason was that for women was that they were not particularly fast cars, but they were easy to drive. But the main thing is that they didn't require cranking, which a gasoline powered engine did, or all the heat and smoke and steam and water that the steam powered cars did. So here were these little electric cars, which were very clean and easy to drive. And doctors liked them because they didn't make any noise. They could leave and that's weird hours in the morning to go off and deliver a baby without disturbing their neighbors and so on. So that was a huge thing. And obviously the third mode of power was gasoline and gasoline was plentiful, uh, inexpensive um, uh, and relatively powerful. And all you needed to do was to be able to crank a car. And so sales went back and forth between these three segments. And at one time steam would be outselling electric that would be outselling gasoline. It went back and forth until eventually gasoline cars took over, but that wasn't until many years later when the self-starter was invented and fitted into a Cadillac. And then you didn't have to worry about this business of cranking a car any longer. And then gasoline powered cars really took off. Ah, we've got a wonderful yes. picture of an early automobile there. Yeah, so I think this one I have labeled as a curve dash olds. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. If, yeah, so um, so that sort of references this would have been a gas car um, right around the same period of time that the Boston automobile steam carriages were being made. Yeah, 1903, yeah. 1904 uh, would have been the, uh, the curve dash Oldsmobile. And actually some research I did recently on Ransom E. Olds, uh, the founder of the company, uh, was that one of his cars, his very first car, uh, that was steam operated, not uh, gasoline powered, ended up being shipped to Bombay, India. And there's a great <laughs> photograph or picture of that a drawing, actually, of that, of that car. So there's a topic for another whole lecture one of these days is the ransom holes <laughs> and shipping cars to, to uh, India. But yeah, that's a, that's, that's a wonderful little car. And you can see a curved dash Oldsmobile uh, in the collection at, at the Seal Cove, a really pretty little car. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we know that now there is no automobile, automobile manufacturing plant in downtown Bar Harbor. So uh, ultimately this venture failed. And I think we would be hard pressed to know about this at all if it weren't thanks for, to the digital archive um, and this being able to find this history online. Why did you learn from your research? Uh, why did this company end up failing? What happened? Well. It was very much a part of the story of car wars. This battle that was going on uh, between um, basically the rusticators who came to the island, the supposed clients for the car, uh, who you know really were coming to get away from noise and pollution. They didn't want cars. The locals want, wanted cars. There was huge friction between the two. And uh, that was what in essence, was referred to that period as the, the car wars. So it was reported, and I'll read this little segment here, reported in the Bar Harbor record of April 11th, 1900, a special town meeting was held to see if the town 
will vote to abolish the existing town ordinance prohibiting or regulating the use of automobiles in said town and to pass a new ordinance to regulate the use of the same. The town in question was Bar Harbor. The ensuing debate pitted locals from both sides of the auto wars against each other. For example, Edward H. Mears spoke for the rusticators, expressing that the summer people should decide whether to allow cars on the island or not. A new ordinance was voted on, and it did not fare well for the automobile. Among the rather draconian measures adopted was this gem. No person shall use, have use of an automobile until he has the written permission from the selectmen of Eden. So now you had not only the rusticators who were supposed to be the clients basically against automobiles, but you have this town ordinance making them virtually illegal or impossible to use unless you went through this whole rigmarole. So it was no wonder really at this point that the company really realized that they just didn't have the market or the sales and uh, they folded up the company. Um, they thought about relocating, but I think really the the energy and the money and the investment at that point and the disappointment and the battle about cars and so on was just too much for them. And the company just disappeared into the history books, as they say. <laughs> so um, I just encourage those of you watching on Facebook or here on the webinar with us on Zoom, please feel free to post questions into the chat or um, into the Facebook page. and. We'll make sure to ask those of Roberto as we're um, heading into the last 10 minutes of our Chibaco chat. I'm uh, happy to share any questions or comments that you have about, um, about this topic. So, okay, so we, we've talked a little bit about the company itself and the automobiles, and we've tried to put this a little bit at, um, in, in terms of sort of what was happening on a larger scale with the automobile uh, industry at large in the early 1900s. So the Seal Cove Auto Museum really has an amazing collection of cars, and we know that there's a curved dash Oldsmobile there that can be seen. But are there any kinds of cars in that collection that would maybe be similar to what was built by the Boston Automobile Company or yeah. main built cars that people could see? Absolutely. Uh, there are a number of very early steam automobiles. The picture that you brought up is one of the 1900 Skeen. Uh, it was built in Lewiston, Maine. Um, amazingly, who would have thought? Another scheme was found. We thought, of course, we had the only one in the entire world when this one was purchased in Great Britain and uh, repatriated to the United States. But in doing research in the Bullporn magazine, uh, uh, my gosh, there was an article about this gentleman down in Massachusetts who had found this old car and it was a scheme built in. Lewiston, Maine, and he'd restored it. And uh, although he had sadly passed away, his son had the car. Um, Bill Barter, one of the, the curator at the, at the Silco Auto Museum, made several trips down to visit. The owner of the car had come up to the museum several times to visit. And lo and behold, um, a few months ago, um, he decided to loan his family car to the museum. So there is a yet another skiing at the museum. My real hope is that we will get Richard Fraser uh, uh, to come to visit and have a look through the car. There's always been some question, especially in Richard Fraser's mind, as to whether uh, the one that you see the picture of is a Rand, also built in Lewiston, Maine, or a skiing. Uh, but in any event, it would be really fun to get his opinion. But this little car that you're looking at right now is absolutely typical of what the, um, uh, the Boston would have looked like, the little standard. Uh, there are other wonderful steam cars as well from that period. There's a 1900 locomobile steam car. There's a 1904 Stanley steamer. Um, there is a very, very interesting 1901 Victor steam car that has a metal body, which is quite unusual. So yeah, absolutely visitors can see not only cars that are almost identical, to the Boston, but a wonderful range of uh, steam cars. There are quite a few steam cars in the collection. Yeah. 
So we have one question that is asking where, what is currently on the site on West Street? So I was just paging through your slides to see if it gave an address on West Street. And I don't actually see a specific street address in any no. of these. Um, so West Street <laughs> itself, you know, would be down uh, between where, uh, like along the waterfront between the um, town dock and along where the Bar Harbor Inn is and the West Street Cafe and the Whale Watch. So where specifically along that stretch on West Street, um, I'm not positive where the company would have been located. Uh, if we ever found an address, you could find you could find that and figure it out. But you could. I mean, I've looked uh, on maps from the period to see if there was one of those buildings that was labeled as the Boston Automobile Company, but none popped out, which was very disappointing. I thought for sure I could find the location of it, but so far, not yet. But mind you, the maps I've looked at are not the best and maybe not the most uh, accurate as far as listing the, the businesses that were on the building. So another little bit of research that one of these days, maybe I can uh, get going and see if we can pin down where the heck this building was, which would be pretty neat, especially yeah, if, if it still exists. exists. Yeah. 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 Um, we have a question. Why did steam and electric power ultimately lose out to the gas powered engine? Well, I think it was really convenience uh, as I mentioned, the electric cars, um, they were a little bit on the slow side. Uh, you did still have to have this incredible contraption that looked like kind of the uh, switchboard in a Frankenstein movie down <laughs> in the basement of your house with levers and gauges and all sorts of stuff. Uh, all the batteries had to be taken out of the car at night. They had to be taken down into the basement, plugged up to one of these chargers, charged up, put back in the car the next day. Um, if you were, again, a wealthy society lady with servants who did that for you, terrific. But as cars became more popular uh, and prices started to come down and so on, that was just seemed to be ridiculous and way too much money. Um, the steam cars were incredibly fast uh, and did last for quite a while. I've forgotten when the last uh, of the steam cars was made, but I think it went right up into the early 30s. But um, uh, again, a steam car was something that really appealed much more to men who wanted to go fast. The neat thing about a steam car, and we actually have one at the museum that you can see a, a, a K semi racer Stanley steamer that uh, uh, did 140 something miles an hour uh, on the beach in Florida at Ormond Beach. Uh, Ormond Beach. Um, but again, you know, if you have a chance to go to the museum on a, on a weekend when you know that they're demonstrating one of the steam cars go it's really fun to see it but also they're so cool the process takes forever before you know they're adjusting valves and filling this and bleeding that and pushing this and so on it, it just goes on forever and then finally this thing roars into life and takes off but not the most convenient thing gasoline by gosh i mean you got in them, uh, they were big, they were comfortable. And as I say, once the electric starter had been fitted into Cadillac, it started to show up in every single car imaginable. And you just basically pushed a button down on the floorboard and the engine whirled a few times and you adjusted a couple of levers on the steering column. And the next thing you knew, the car was running and away you went. And while you were on the steam um, comment, we had a question that, um, what was the fuel used to generate the steam? Well, there were different fuels. Uh, I'm always a little bit mystified by it. I know we have uh, one steam car that I believe operates off of propane uh, at the museum. Uh, there was like compressed gas, gasoline that could be used. Uh, different fuels, as long as you could get something that could be pressurized and make a, a hot flame to uh, boil the water in the, in, in the boiler, you could power a steam car. I think the real fun idea about steam cars though that I always thought was quite lovely was that uh, when you took off a, in one, you again had a limited range until all of the water had boiled off. And what you would have to do was go to the nearest lake or horse water trough. Think of the one in, 
in Bar Harbor <laughs> and uh, with hoses and so on, uh, refill the, uh, the tank, the water tank on the car. Yeah. And then we had a Facebook comment that um, the other founder of the Boston Automobile Company that's listed Billings uh, was formerly the chief, chief of, of police in Bar Harbor, which I didn't realize. So um, that's super interesting to know. Thank you for sharing that, Sam. Um, so we always go through these talks so quickly. They're so interesting, but I did wanna just make a quick plug for the Seal Cove Auto Museum. You guys open for the season on May 1st, is that right? We're opening on May the 1st as usual. And uh, the museum is open every single day. Uh, from uh, 10 in the morning until five o'clock at night. Um, so yeah, absolutely a uh, plan on a visit coming up very, very soon. And you still do demonstrations on Tuesdays? They do uh, chats. Uh, I haven't seen the full calendar for the, uh, for the year. I know that they're uh, going to be certain continuing with Cars and Coffee, which are uh, monthly car shows bring what you've got and they're a lot of fun because people show up with all sorts of things. Sometimes they're themed exhibits um, or themed car shows like Steam um, or it's just uh, whatever shows up, but those will be definitely going on. Um, and very, very soon, all of those things will start to show up on the museum's website, on their Facebook page and so on. So be Great. able to plan your And I would encourage people to go and check out Engines of Change, which is a suffrage centennial um, exhibit actually curated by the, the usual host for Chewbacca Chats, Jenna Jandro, did the um, curation for Engines of Change and the way that the automobile was an important, played an important part in women's suffrage. So um, thank you very much. I just want to make an announcement that next week is the last Chewbacca Chat of the spring season. And then we'll be taking a break until the fall because it's too nice to be inside and uh, on webinars. But we have pre-recorded a Chewbacca chat between Jennifer, I mean, uh, yeah, Jennifer Steen Boer, uh, who has done a series of original artworks that are appearing in this edition of Chewbacca about climate change. So she's going to be talking with Jenna Jandro about the works that she did and her research into climate change and how she captured all that science into these incredibly evocative images that are actually gonna go on exhibit in May and then be part of a public program series that we're launching in cooperation that was funded by the Maine Humanities Council um, later this summer. So that is a pre-recorded Chewbacca chat. You'll be able to watch it live on um, Facebook or on YouTube, but you won't be able to ask questions in real time. So instead, um, we would encourage you, if you have questions, to list them um, during the or on the Facebook page or send us an email and we'll get back to you after the fact and answer those questions. But Roberto, uh, thank you so much for your time and your perspective and for sharing this really fascinating story about this manufacturing plant in downtown Bar Harbor. Um, we've got some comments coming in. Thank you. So nice to see you. Great job. So um, we'll be excited to see how people feel when they read the article as well and get a little more information. Absolutely, Rainy. And again, such a pleasure to join you to do this today. It's always fun. Um, let's see uh, what, what maybe pops up in the next few couple of years. That's right. Thank you, everyone. Take care.